I'm Shazad Khaled. I'm an uh, anatomy research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And my topic today is uh, on the neuroanatomy, neuropsychology of pain. Um, so this is a paper I wrote, I think, 30 pages long, uh, but it's still in the process of being submitted and um, hopefully published. So please don't steal my research. <laughs> okay. <We'll be> <laughs> um, so what is pain? Basically, uh, say you have your finger on a hot pot or something on the stove. Um, you'll have a sensation of that heat uh, transmitted, uh, uh, your tissue is being damaged at that point. Uh, so peripheral nociceptors are recruited um, and you get an activation of it like continuously until, and, until you like remove that finger off that uh, stove. So the uh, basic response of pain is basically a protective response uh, to protect you from this uh, tissue damage. Um, all this results in like uh, chemicals being released, uh, the release of cytokines, uh, growth factors, prostenoids. So this is important for the nervous system to learn and recognize that uh, you know you want to remove this faster and quicker the next time you get this stimulus again. Um, so this all this result revolves around uh, neuronal plasticity and gain in sensitivity. So again, yeah, you detect it earlier the next time around. And however, like persistent pain is the opposite. It's uh, pathological. That won't be normal. Uh, that results in the loss of protection pain offers to the body. So a lot of people who suffer from uh, chronic pain, uh, that's pathological. Um, so epidemiology, quickly. Um, uh, why are we talking about pain? Uh, well, it's the most common reason for a physician visit. Uh, more than 100 million Americans are uh, suffering from chronic pain. Um, the lo uh, lost work time exceeds uh, 50 million days at uh, that's what's known from uh, NIH statistics. Um, and the lost productivity uh, results in like $61.2 billion per year. So it's a big, uh, you know, total cost of persistent pain is being placed at like $560, $635 billion annually. So this is far more than any other six major disease. Like the second one is cardiovascular, and that's $309 billion. So that's like pain is basically twice that. Um, and comorbidities associated with pain add to the burden of patients and families. So, you know, you get opioid overuse, misuse, dependence, addiction, depression, uh, poor social relationships, and financial hardship. So, yeah, it's a big significant uh, uh, burden, like clinically, economically, and socially. So, that's why we're talking about this today. Uh, so mechanism, just briefly going over the physiology. So first step, you know, you have a uh, stimulus. You have to convert that from the periphery as a, at the nociceptive uh, sensory fibers into an action potential. And that's uh, once that threshold is reached for that action potential to be uh, triggered, that's when you in, uh, generate a nerve impulse. And that propagates along the primary afferent fiber to the central nervous system. Uh, and if uh, intensity increases, you uh, recruit additional nerve fibers. And um, uh, basically, at the, uh, at the end of it, you're not really uh, getting information from just one pain receptor, because there's always branching. Uh, so because of that, you'll always end up with like more than one pain receptor uh, transmitting information. Um, so neuroanatomy, um, uh, basically, you, all you have to know is that there are three large groups to simplify it. Um, the first one is the A alpha, A beta, and A gamma. Uh, these are basically the touch and perception uh, fibers, so not really related to pain. Uh, but the second ones, uh, A, A delta fibers, these are the small and slowly conducting ones. So this is like sharp pain sensation. Uh, there are two types of it. So the high threshold one, these respond to like intense mechanical stimulation. And then there's others that respond to both like heat, uh, uh, noxious and non-noxious temperatures. And then the third group would be the C fibers one. So these are the small, like very uh, slowly conducting unmyelinated fibers. And uh, that's mostly like burns, um, or it's like polymodal. So you have like a lot of thermal, uh, chemical irritant stimuli, mechanical, everything, all kinds are the C fiber ones. Uh, and then obviously there are subtypes, so uh, I won't get into that, but there's like for subtypes for heat, mechanical pressure, acid stimulus, among other things. So it's not really a simple process. There's a lot that revol uh, when it comes to pain, like there's a lot that goes into it, uh, but we're just trying to simplify it here. Um, then obviously you have to know pain. Um, there's activation, modulation, modification, like a lot happening. Um, at the biochemical level. So nociception, which is basically the sensation of pain, 
uh, that's mediated through obviously intracellular, extracellular, molecular um, messengers, like anything else in your body. Um, you transmit this information via glutamate, which is a sense uh, excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, and at the end, you because of the injury to your side, you get all these inflammatory mediators being released. So like neurotransmitters such as serotonin, lipids such as prostaglandins, peptides, and neurotrophins. All of this involves pain. Um, all this uh, send transmission of afferent signals to dorsal horn uh, of the spinal cord. And there are among other things like substance P. Um, all this like adds to the inflammatory soup. You recruit like immune cells uh, when you uh, trigger alpha, uh, A delta and C fibers. And you can even get like uh, histamine and then that targeting mast cells and substance P, um, calcitonin gene related peptide. Sorry, all of that being released. So it's a big mess. And obviously increased meta metabolism that also uh, gives you lactic acid and that also excites nociceptors. Um, so Rex Lemon, I want to talk to about this briefly because not a lot of people know about this. So these are the 10 layers of gray matter uh, that sit in your spinal cord and the dorsal uh, <coughs> horn. So information is basically rela uh, relayed from your dorsal root uh, ganglion, like the sensory cells sitting there. Uh, there's a lateral division and a medial division. Uh, the medial division re revolves around the nucleus gracilis, nucleus caniatus. I think you know the, these are the uh, fine touch um, vibration and uh, uh, sorry, fine touch vibration and uh, proprioception. Uh, these the gracilis ones are from the ground up, so that's how I remember G for gracilis, G for ground, uh, from ground up to the uh, top. Uh, and nucleus cuneatus is from your arm and upper level. And these, yeah, are on the medial division of the dorsal root ganglia. And the uh, one we are concerned with in pain is from the lateral division, which are obviously the unmyelinated and small myelinated axons that carry pain and temperature. Um, and these terminate in Rex lamina one, two, and four. Um, and one to four lamina, these are the main like extraceptive sensation and comprise the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Uh, so more like now into the sending tracks, you can see that the, uh, um, it, this all uh, is known as the postural lateral tract, which is also the Lee Sawyer's tract. Uh, and these processes ascend approximately like two levels uh, above before synapsing on second order neurons. And the secondary neurons from these Rex lamina, say regions one and uh, five, they're decussate. So, you know, pain and temperature is contralateral side of the body and uh, um, the fine touch and vibration is more ipsilateral. So these one will be crossing the anterior white cumicer across uh, and then ascending into the contralateral lateral spinal thalamic tract. And essentially when they go to the brain stem, they reach the BPL uh, nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, and that's where you perceive and then uh, more going to the main somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe where everything is interpreted. And so this, all this pain sensation and all these uh, other touch sensation, they all end up in the VPL nucleus of the thalamus. And the VML is known for the face and neck from the trigeminal nerve. Mm. And so now, uh, like more specifically, I think some people get confused when you talk about the lateral spinothalamic tract, because there's also an anterior spinothalamic tract sitting in front. And that's more for crude touch and pressure. So sometimes we forget about that. Uh, but the lateral spinothalamic one is the pain and temperature. And so now more getting into the psychology part of it. So there were like a lot of these studies that uh, we discussed in this paper, but I wanted to touch base with like one of them uh, that I, that was one of my favorite. Uh, there's no time to talk about all the other studies that we reviewed. Uh, so fear avoidance med, uh, model, what is that? So the current understanding of pain related fear is that it's a psychopathological problem where people who catastrophize, uh, you know, worry about the pain. Um, are the people who become trapped in this, you know, pain vicious cycle of like avoidance behavior, pain and disability. So this is a fear avoidance model. Uh, there's evidence that pain related fear with low back pain, for example, when one is told, you know, that their back is vulnerable or degenerating or damaged. Uh, in this instance, like avoidance is a common sense, you know, response to protect your back. Um, so when first, like someone develops this low back pain, you know, confrontation of uh, normal activity in the absence of catastrophizing leads to recovery. But the pathway to recovery for individuals trapped in the fear avoidance cycle, however, is more or less clear. So that's what we want to study here, like the understanding pain-related fear 
from a common sense perspective, enables like physiotherapists to offer more individuals with low back pain and high fear a pathway to recovery by altering how they make sense of their pain, essentially. So this study, uh, recent study by Mohammed et al. Uh, uh, investigated the mediating role of pain behaviors and the association between pain catastrophizing and pain intensity, explored the moderating role of the family caregiver's response to pain and the link between pain behaviors and pain intensity. So they studied about like 154 chronic pain patients and their family caregivers. Uh, they each uh, completed questionnaires regarding pain intensity, pain catastrophizing, pain behaviors, and the caregiver's response to their pain. And then family caregivers also did these questionnaires in response to the patient's pain. Um, so the re results was basically that the pain catastrophizing was associated with pain intensity and pain behaviors partly mediated this association. So significant, if, you know, the patients reported that their family caregivers also showing uh, were showing like high levels of solicitous distracting responses. Uh, then they also had like high levels of solicitous response. Like the caregivers, whenever they showed this concern, the patient reported more pain. And uh, so these findings were in line with the idea that family caregivers solicited distracting responses convey to patients that their condition is serious, which may reinforce uh, some patients' pain and pain behaviors, you know, especially in people who catastrophize. So now, uh, I think I'm going over time, so I'll just wrap this up quickly. Uh, so drugs and therapy, um, basically at the end of it, you'll have pain. Um, Painkillers are being uh, overly prescribed, you know, uh, all over the world. Um, but yeah, they need those pain medications because um, pathological pain is a big concern. Um, so yeah, you have pharmacology pharmacological agents that treat both acute and chronic pain at different levels. So you can have opioids that affecting the brain, a local anesthetic epidural you can give for a spinal cord, uh, and you can have anti-inflammatory drugs on the skin. But basically, what works better is a systems-based multidisciplinary approach. So you want all the drugs, not just the drugs, but you want pharmacology, rehab, psychology, pain, coping skills, and alternate and complementary therapies. Um, and that works better, especially for chronic persistent pain. So that's my talk. Thank you.